Johannes Mallow is one of my favorite custodians of the great memory tradition, not only because he has done so much to demonstrate the power of memory techniques through his competition wins and breaking records, but also because he's so down to earth and practical about the differences between how these techniques are applied to competition and how you apply them to long-term retention when you're using them to learn something. Now, this is beautiful because we get into the topic, he and I, of keeping a memory journal so that you can develop your mnemonic systems at the highest possible level and then practice them in such a way through analysis that you improve them as quickly as you can and then have ongoing improvements as you continue to use them, either for competitive outcomes or for long-term learning goals. So I absolutely love this conversation, and I love that it's the first time that he and I got together on a Zoom call to speak, and it was as if we had spoken many, many times before and been friends of memory for years, which we have been even though this was the first recorded conversation, the first of many to come, I hope. So if you like this kind of content, hit that thumbs up. Let the robots know that humans still care about the great memory tradition. And if you're new here, get subscribed. And I can't wait for your thoughts, which I hope you'll type, type, type below in the conversation. And maybe if you have any further questions, let us know and we'll record something in the future as soon as we can. Thanks for watching and please enjoy this conversation with Johannes Mallow. <laughs> Liebe Leute, genau, aber wir, wir können auch gerne zum Englischen wechseln, wenn es oh, äh, ja, leichter ich, für dich ist. Ich glaube, das, das ist besser. <lacht> so, Sehr gut. Ja, uh, yeah, so, uh, thank you. It's always good to have a little chance to speak German anyway. Yeah, uh, by the way, Anthony, thank you very much for inviting me because um, we never had the chance to really talk directly. I mean, uh, we, are, we are in contact via Twitter or stuff like that, but never really met somewhere or somehow. So nice to be here today. Oh, well, thank you. And I don't know how that so much time has passed that we haven't done this, but <laughs> other than I, I I make the mistake sometimes of having 50,000 things to do, um, which <sighs> one, one would be advised not to, but, you know, that's also one of the great things about being alive is you can try to <laughs> try to break your own ability to multitask. <laughs> yeah, I guess it, 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 this is life, isn't it? So it's, uh, yeah. uh, this, this is straightforward life. I don't think that this exists. So it's always a bit little curvy and going here and there. And at some point you meet, um, even if you think, okay, we could have met uh, years ago, but today is the day. So I see you here. <laughs> We, uh, you're in Magdeburg. I am in Magdeburg. Yeah, it's Magdeburg is uh, yeah kind of a small town in Germany, like two hundred thousand people, um, and living here since almost twenty years right now. Wow. Well, so I've been there once, I think, uh, just on a tour in Magdeburg. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just driving around Germany. I I think I've been in in every every what is it Bundesland. Um, the, the different mm -hmm. prom provinces so and then in every every different area i've been to the, the the bigger or the most major names or the cities so i don't have yeah magdeburg is actually the capital of saxony anhalt mm. uh Sax saxon anhalt um so it's it's actually not that small but in terms of, if you compare it to like munich or berlin or Cologne, it's uh, it's a rather small city, but it's still it's a nice place to live because everything is uh, it's not that big, so that means we have big parks and uh, much green. We have a nice river um, through the city, and it's perfect for students because it's cheap. Um, and yeah, it's it's getting more expensive nowadays, but yeah. So I went here for my studies and. I'm still here, but I'm not studying anymore. So, uh, but uh, yeah, somehow I, 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 I'm still here. That's great. What had you studied? What did you study? Uh, I studied, uh, I studied, actually it's uh, information technologies. Oh. Um, it, it's about um, processing information in a digital way. So if you can phrase it like that. So it's about high frequency technique and uh an engineer study, study, study. And uh, I finished that with a diploma thesis 
uh, in 2008 and uh, worked then um, in the field of MRI research uh, mm-hmm. from the techni- from the technical side. So um, I was researching in terms of how to improve the MRI system, how to get better images from your brain, maybe with um, with better resolution to see maybe some something what's going on, maybe a small tumor or anything. So have better images with more higher contrast, higher resolution. And I was researching on that. Wow. Well, well, that must be, do you, do you cross index that with your interest in memory at all? I get l- yeah. lots of questions where people say, you know, what's happening in the brain of these people with the memory techniques? Are they just practicing more or is there a special advantage? I've even heard you say that you think maybe with names, some people have like an extra gift just with that particular category. Mm. So anything come up in your studies with that? Uh, I mean, I, I'm more from the technical part. So improving the technical um, um, technical stuff behind the MRI system to improve it. But I also was part of a study um, and we studied or our sub- subjects were memory athletes and they had to memorize a 50 digit sequence um, and we wanted to see what happens during memorization, during recall, when they use the um, method of loci and memory palace method. And uh, I mean, this was not so new what we saw there because it's it's already has done before. Um, and in this study, we couldn't see anything specific about uh, what people, I mean, we, we were able to see that people of course use different parts of the brain in comparison to people who don't use any memory techniques, um, the visual part and uh, the navigation part and so on. But uh, looking that deep that you could see, okay, this person um, is able to memorize names easier because yes, well, he or she has some something different in this part of the brain. I don't know if that, something like that exists. Would be very interesting to know. Uh, right, right, yeah. So did you say 15 numbers or 50? I didn't quite. 50, 50, uh, 50 50 numbers. I I thought it must be 50, but I wanted to check in case (laughs) the translation. I think. Yeah, I see. Uh, It's 50 and they had to do it eight times. So um, 50 digits and a break, then another 50 digits, another break eight times in a row uh, to go uh, to have uh, have more data for everyone. And then we had the subjects without any techniques. And uh, then we tried to find if there is any difference. And there was, of course, and what happens during. What was interesting was that um, during memorization, you usually, or people who use memory techniques, the memory palace, they walk and navigate through their palace. And we were thinking that this must happen during recall as well. And um we could see that, but it was not that obvious anymore. So the memorization process was way more, um, way more intensive than the recall process. The recall process seems to be just like grabbing the information and pulling them out. Uh, and the memorization process was, there was everything what we uh, expected to see, the navigation, the visualization and so on. But during recall, it was, not nothing, but it was way less. It was very interesting. So the effort comes from the memorization. Uh, the recall is is easy then. Wow. So, so much to say or ask about this, <laughs> really. Um, sure. Well, first of all, do you know of or did they in this study then do anything around retention? So, you know, how many of those numbers were retained for five days? 15 days, 50 days for that matter. Do they ever yeah, do studies of that? Unfortunately, no. Mm. We didn't do that. I think there are studies, but I'm really not the expert in studies about memory. So that's a, right. that's a thing what I sometimes read here and there. But uh, I think Boris, uh, I think you know Boris, Boris Conrad. Right. Um, he, he is a really expert about that. He is doing his own studies still and is a researcher on this field. So right. I'm just a small light in compared to him in, in this regard. So... Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. We'll drop that. But um, so the idea that you're walking through a memory palace, 
is pretty interesting to me to see that the brain would show signs of this in in the it was it mri with this this test that they were using yes it was an mri system yeah. so and that's navigation systems in the brain with visual or is one a bit both. Sort of, they're sort of coordinated yeah, both both actually yeah coordinated somehow but i mean yeah both parts were more active than in the other subjects so when it's like when when people say they walk through memory palace that that i my you you have that sort of calendar behind you when i when i would think of navigating my memory palace it's more like cells and so the navigation would be this cell this cell this cell like literally on a bookshelf there 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 mm -hmm. and then down 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 like that sort of thing i wouldn't strictly it is navigating but i wouldn't strictly think of that as walking through a memory palace it'd be more like no, it's not even like this but it'd be more like standing in the room and then looking and almost reading mm. the wall sort of thing so do do you know if any of the studies or the subjects in the study did that sort of thing or is it is it a more of a predominant technique that people are walking from spot to spot or loci to loci yes i think the the second one so it's more from loci to loci um and i feel that in I'm I'm coming from memory sports area, so having seen and talked to a lot of memory athletes, and I feel that almost everyone is doing it in this when it comes to memory sports, being fast and being uh, memorizing as many digits as possible in a short time. Uh, then it's almost everyone using that loci by loci thing. And for myself, for example, I have memory um, palaces for memory sports, but I would use a memory palace totally different when it comes to uh, memorize other stuff real real life stuff so because then i have time i have time to create the cell maybe you call it like that so mm -hmm. create the cell and have put as many information in a good structured way into each cell but it, when it goes to memory sports it's rather being fast efficient efficient and um yeah don't overload every location because then it's it's a bit messy so there's a difference for me for memory palaces for learning and memory palaces for memory sports right yeah well, i want to get into this but one thing just that i gotta ask before we move into sports and the difference between competition and learning tasks your interest in the visualization or the making information visual about imaging the brain and so forth. Do you feel there's any correlation between your interest in that and your interest in improving how you use memory techniques, which would somehow involve imaging, <laughs> improving the imaging of, you know, translating this or that into something that you can capture back faster? Is there any correlation between that? Uh, so you mean my interest in MRI um, technology and yeah, if I'm, I understood sure you correctly, you, you've worked on improving yes. uh, how <laughs> the brain is imaged, which is kind mm -hmm. of like a translation of stimuli or whatever uh, that then yeah. is received by a machine, which then has better output, which is essentially a kind of thing that a memory athlete does, is improving the reception and the expression of a stimuli. Basically. To, be, to be honest, you're, you're the first one pointing that out to me. Um, so I, I really never thought about it uh, in that way because, I mean, I could, I think I could construct a relation here, but I feel that the way I got into that field and things um, was not uh, so much related to memory sports. It was really from the technical side. But of course, um, if you think deeper about that, maybe there is a coincidence here somehow, but not intentionally. Right, right. Yeah, no, I don't want to construct a relationship that isn't there, but just yeah. a, just a curious thing. <laughs> oh, interesting, yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So now, when there, there's just like so many avenues to go here, go with, but just to be kind of tedious, perhaps, for the sake of myself and for others, what is... What is memory as a sport in in how you experience it and how you, you you're an active promoter of it also as well as 
a person who who engages in the activity of it. So what is it? Mm-hmm. What attracts you to it? And you know, what 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 are your what what makes it so attractive to you that you become a promoter of it as well as a, a practitioner? So for me, it's a it's a bit of a personal story in this regard. Um, and I, I started memory training, memory sports in 2003. Um, I was watching a TV show and someone was showing some memory skills. And I was very interested at this point into how does it work? Is this Why is this guy capable of memorizing a deck of cards, for example? Um, and I was like, okay, how do, do, does it work? I went to the internet and did my research. And I found out about memory competitions. And back then, um, you need to understand a bit about my background. I have a, a muscle disease, a muscle dystrophy, uh, which means that nowadays I need to use an electric wheelchair. And in 2003, I was still walking and uh, it started to affect my body more and more. So I was around 20 and I was affected more and more. I had problems, trouble getting upstairs and stuff like that, and trouble walking, not falling down to the floor. And I, but I was a very competitive person. I, I love to play table tennis, for example, in the club and uh, things like that. So I was also, I like to do sports and being con- competitive, but I couldn't do that anymore. And um, becoming or having this disease in your early 20s means it, it's a bit like getting growing old when you're 20 because you're, you're getting slower, you're, you're getting weaker, you fall down and things like, I would have heard from my grandma maybe. And so that affected me mentally very much because I was I was really depressed. For about 10 years, I was um, living or fighting depression very hard. And um, at this point, memory sports came to me somehow. And I was like, I can do that. I can compete with others here. And it's fun. It's It's somehow unbelievable that it's possible to memorize the uh, 400 digit number in five minutes it that sounds ridiculous incredible and unnecessary also but in a competitive way it's um it was a possibility again to compete with others on a high level and i felt i'm i I saw myself going to a top level very fast so i felt okay why i'm so good here why what what do i do every something different here i don't know but i i just um um, went with it. So I was going to German championship, to the world championship, and uh, finally won that world championship in 2012. And memory sports is really about uh, having a clear structure of material. So for example, there are 10 disciplines uh, for, for example, five minute numbers. So you have to memorize as many digits as you can within five minutes, or you have 15 minute words, you have to memorize a list of random words within 15 minutes. So it's it's really structured like in physical sports. You have 100 meters to run, you have 200 meters, you have high jump, um, long jump and stuff like that. So it's really competitive and structured. And uh, that fascinated me because I was good and because it, I felt I got something here and I felt that helps me somehow to get back on, on the horse maybe and travel the world, compete with others and it really somehow um saved my life is a bit maybe too much but it was really helping me here at, at a specific at a very difficult time in my life and uh when i wanted to and i at, at some point i decided i really want to be become world champion so you have to travel to china to london and stuff like that and with such a disease is difficult and in 2011 i was still walking but it was if there was just a little bit of wind coming from the side. I was just falling down to the floor and I couldn't get up from, by my own anymore. I would have to ask people to help me up again. And um, But I wanted to become the world champion and I knew if I want to be that, I have to go to the competition. But I can't do that by walking. So I needed to take a wheelchair. And I felt like I don't want to have a wheelchair because it's so bad. It's like um, being limited, but Actually, it's the opposite. So having uh, taking taking this wheelchair made my life limitless somehow because I was able to travel again. I was able to um, walk or roll 
uh, along the street and watching um, the nice trees or windows or whatever while I when I was walking I was staring at my feet trying not to fall down so it it really was a huge and important step and becoming world champion was getting back or I needed to take a wheelchair for that so I decided to take that and it was a hard decision but I never regret it in totally opposite it gave me so much freedom and the possibility to travel to these competitions. So, yeah, long story short, but that's uh, actually my story behind Memory Sports. <laughs> right, right. Well, I love that you share that. And to me, it's just one of those things where it's it's hard to know how to talk to some people sometimes because I know about you, uh, you know, just making it happen, you know, whatever it takes to do it. And that limitlessness that comes from, you know, seeing a certain issue a different way just gets you to the goal, right? And I don't know, I've talked about this a little bit before, but one of my mentors in business, uh, John Morrow, he operates a multi-million dollar business and he can only move his mouth. That's the only part of his body that he can move, you know? And it's, just sometimes so extraordinary that people come and probably they come to you as well with these, like, how do you, I don't know how to kindly position certain things when I know about my business mentor and I know about people like yourself to just be like, you know, there's bigger problems than not having time to practice <laughs> sort of thing. How do you, sure. you know, having been the person that's experienced that change where you're just like, I'm going to make this happen. You know, how do you, express those kinds of or deal with those kinds of um non-limiting factors that people have built in their minds as limiting factors and i'm i'm sure there's just a, an endless list of excuses why people can't practice why they can't study the techniques etc um mm -hmm. do you have do you have ways that you formulate that um how how to be, uh, how to overcome these limits yeah uh, maybe or what maybe you can rephrase the question a bit for me sorry yeah, I'm trying to like <laughs> phrase it in a way that is uh, yeah. generous, generous. But I myself, like just myself, like I have little pathetic yeah. sob stories all the time, right? And one of the things that I do is I remind myself of my business mentor who runs this company I with see. only his mm -hmm. mouth. And so I kind of, you know, buck up, man, just, just, just make it mm -hmm. happen. Okay. So uh, I kind of like, what yeah. do you do in your mind to make that change where you're just like, I don't want the wheelchair, but. I'm going to do it, which maybe this is another false analogy that I'm asking you to construct, like the analogy between visualizing MRI better and memory techniques. But, you know, what do you, what, what do you do in your mind when you, like, I've heard you talk about saying, you know, there's a, there's parts of memory practice that I don't necessarily enjoy, but I have to get myself to do it. So I guess mm -hmm. I'm, is there an analogy between that, you know, that inner yeah. gumption to just make it happen when Oh, I don't like practicing names, but I'm going to make myself do it. You know, I'm going to make myself do whatever it yeah, takes yeah, to get to yeah. Beijing or whatever. Yeah, I mean, um, I feel it's it's about having a specific goal. Um, if you you're reaching out for something and you need to figure out what to what are you what do you have to do for that? And even if there are things you don't want to do, um, you have to think about your goal again. Um, think, okay, I have to do that, but I don't want to. Okay, so how important this goal is really to me? And if you feel, okay, it's not that important, yeah, okay, then skip it. But uh, I feel that this is this goes for everyone because everyone, no matter if this is a disease or, uh, I don't know, a de depression or family issues or whatever it is, everyone has something what... What makes it a bit more? What makes it more difficult to get into practice, get into training, and stuff like that? And when people sometimes people come to me and say, "Oh, your problem is way bigger than my problem, and uh, why I don't get it done here?" So um, can you help me with that? And I, I'm always like, I mean, my problem for me is was big and is big. But your problem for you is big and was big. So I would never say your big your problem is little or small in comparison to mine because it's not. It's always that big as it is in your head. And even a small problem from the outside 
can be huge in your head. And so, um, yeah, I, th I feel having a clear goal or clear vision about what you want to achieve uh, makes it makes it easier to also do steps which are difficult because then you know why you are doing that. And that's the reason you need to know why. Otherwise, it's nonsense. Because I feel some, some kids, they start playing an instrument when they're little. And at some point, maybe when they turn 13, 14, they just don't want to play it anymore because they don't know why. There is no reason maybe for them. Some um just motivated because they like the music. Uh, but others just stop. And then when they are 23 and they uh, want to play the guitar to impress uh, the girlfriend or boyfriend, then they start over again because they know why they have a motivation. Um, and that's it. You need a motivation and a goal. Right. Yeah. Goals are really, really important. But I think that you have done something, if I understood correctly, something I heard you talk about. You've done what I would recommend people to do is not just rely on a goal, but have a systematic process. And you've talked about writing things down, if I understood correctly, like keeping an actual journal of your progress mm -hmm. for analytical purposes. So talk a little bit about the journal keeping uh, process. And that, Yeah, that was uh, super important for me. So when I started Memory Sports, I was just yeah playing around with that. And at some point I was like, I, I need to get more structure into that. I need to have a plan for myself to figure out where are my weaknesses, where I'm strong. And then I was, yeah, I was actually, actually doing just having an Excel sheet and writing everything down what I needed. So which discipline I trained today, uh, what was my score, uh, what were issues, um, uh, which memory palace was I, I was using, um, in which location I might have trouble. So and if that appears again and again, and maybe I have to change the location. So reflection is so crucial if you want to become better at something because you can do the same thing over and over again. But but if you don't reflect on the outcome, then it's uh, it doesn't help you. So um, that was very detailed. And I was, after one week, I was taking a deeper look into it. I was, okay, I did that and that and this. Okay, this looks good right now, uh, but here's there's a bigger problem. Okay, next week I will focus on this specific topic a bit more, or I have to test something, so maybe a new memory system or a new memory palace or whatever it is, and go for that again. And what I was also doing is um, going far beyond my own limits. Like if I was capable, when I was capable of memorizing 200 digits in five minutes, I was aiming for for 400. And I was just making mistakes. So, so many mistakes. So, um, but the, the thing about memory sports and improving here is go far, far beyond your limits and decrease the mistakes. That's, uh, that's a secret, if you can call it like that. <laughs> um, because if you, if you always go for 200, how can you ever achieve 300? So you need to go for 300. And if you have, 200 mistakes, then it's like that. It's no, no other problem. You're at home, you can train. And I know uh, back then in the first attempts, I had like 120 mistakes or anything like that, gaps and mistakes. And then I was decreasing them. Um, so yeah, that was actually what I was doing with my training journal schedule and stuff. And I was doing that very detailed for one year. And then I, I, I was still doing that, but not so detailed anymore uh, because I, I felt, okay, this level is great. And from here, it's more intuitive what, what I will do next. But to get things started and to realize what I need and what works for me, it was great to have something written down. Right, right. Yeah, that's great. So that's interesting that, you know, you need it less and less. Is that because you develop sort of like a metacognitive skill where you just kind of do it mentally as opposed to needing to visualize it for yourself or yeah maybe like if you would um train meditation maybe in the beginning you might uh you might need some audio uh which helps you going through the process calm down sit breathe uh things like that but after a while you don't need that audio anymore you just sit there you know what to do because it's you have done that so often um, and then it's clear, crystal clear. I don't have to remind myself. And um, 
also in terms of when I feel, okay, I trained that, I overtrained maybe that a bit. So I go with something different. Uh, I still have notes, but uh, the the details are not that necessary necessary anymore written down because it's it's like uh, I don't know it's 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 just like daily business. It's not you don't have to write down how to brush your teeth, do you? So, but uh, <laughs> it, yeah, it's it's maybe like that right now. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe some people could benefit from some dental <laughs> care analysis. <laughs> sure. Uh, I can imagine. Uh, I mean, the 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 observation effect is so profound, but there's also probably a procedural memory development as well. Like the procedure of keeping a journal would somehow get into your memory that would then draw you to keeping your own journal, which then draws you to keeping up your own practice. I just don't know where the threshold is where you have to, how many times you have to do it in order for it to sort of start doing you, so to speak, uh, in terms of procedural memory taking over. But some people say it's like 90 days for the uh, connections in the brain yeah. to take over. I, I read something about 21 and 250 days. I don't know. I, I feel <laughs> it's uh, it's different, a bit different, of course, for everyone. Um, but having this ritual of writing things down, doing the next discipline, writing things down. This is really some, it's it's already like a med meditative mental state. And uh, I think people who are professional physical, doing physical sport, like one, running 100 meters, they're doing the same in a different way. They would imagine their own, uh, their own uh, race, for example. So they would imagine how, how it feels running this uh, this track and so on and they always also get data from everything get reflection from the coach or whatever and i feel that is this is part of the training it's not just running as crazy it's 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 a complex thing and yeah and i yeah it, it went very well for me in that way so that's good well yeah I, I, let me just get a little bit nerdy though about the journaling thing because I sure. I get tons of questions about journaling and I want to ask in advance of questions that I get and also maybe be able to send this interview to people. When you keep it like in an Excel file, do you like have a tab for every day and you just create a new tab uh, day one, day two, day three, or do you do days down like this? Or, you know, how are you arranging <laughs> this visually so that it's efficient and effective for you? Any tips on that, that you've made mistakes where you're like, damn, that doesn't work. And yet you, you have a more uh, yeah. refined process. So for me, what worked best was um, splitting it into tabs regarding the um, discipline. So I had a numbers tab. I had a words tab. I had a historical dates tab. And in each tab, I had only the results for this specific discipline um, and written down in a list with the date in the first column. So date, uh, then the next column was what I attempted. So let's say I attempted 200 digits, I write down 200, then the uh, result and the score for that. And then another column, I would write down the memory palace I used as, so I could rotate through all my memory palaces one by one. And in the last column, I would uh, write notes like what was special about it and, and so on. And then of course I had some used colors for specific results. For example, if I um, um, exceeded a specific result, then it was lighting up green. If I was under a specific result, there was lighting up red, uh, stuff like that. So I made it like fun. It was, uh, I love these kind of statistics and stuff. So I was also creating um, diagrams out of my data. So um, over time, how did I improve and where was it going up and down? I even was uh, looking into was I better in the in the morning or in the evening or was it better on the weekends? So I put a lot of effort into just building up these uh, uh, sheets. And this is also something uh, don't I I was always trying not to drift too much into just creating nice sheets because in the end you don't do anything. You just have a super nice journal and it's great and it's cool and it's colorful and it's fun but you don't do your training. That doesn't make any sense. So I was uh, I was drifting here a bit, but when it was at some point, it was really just joyful to put things in there. And yeah, that's actually what I did here with that. 
Cool, cool. Thanks. Well, that's very, very useful, I'm sure, for many people and useful for me too, because often the just sitting around tinkering with the, the device is, is not the not the not the real thing. Genshi Genbutsu, as the Japanese say, the real place, the real thing. Um, but yeah. still still important. Yeah, they, but this is there's no nothing which is perfect. So uh this is also what I experience. I as I said, I tend to try to make it perfect in the first place, the perfect journal, but that's not how it's working. Just go with something, put it in, in a tab, and then see, and you feel, you will feel, okay, I have to organize it a bit different. This has to go extra, and then you do that. So it's developing during the process of training, because in the beginning, you don't know what you will face during training. But while you're doing your training, you see, okay, I need to have a category for that, because this kind of mistake appears over and over again. So I have to do, uh, take a closer look. And you can't do that beforehand. You can do that only while or during the process. So relax and <laughs> just start somehow. Right. So when it comes to the difference between how you would approach something like the Memory Palace for competition and then something for like learning, let's talk a little bit more about how that works and did you do a similar thing keep a journal for that or did you just use the benefits from having kept a journal for a period of time or is it two different realms altogether how do you how do you see that and how did you come into using something like a memory palace for learning mm -hmm. for learning uh recently i did memorize together with uh with a client uh the countries of africa with uh, the capitals and or well, we started that and tried to have a good or tried something out here what we did is we used the white house for that so uh, because you can look it up on on google um and we were going through all the locations first and writing them down also in the list so that's what i would still do writing them down just to make sure that i have them safe in my Mind. The second thing was um, I, we were always um, adapting the locations also to what we are going to learn next, because sometimes it's like you have a specific information, a country, or um, and actually it was like sometimes you have three countries in the north, in the middle, in the south, and they are somehow connected. So I would try to use a location for that, which looks a bit similar to that, like um, like fireplace, for example, there's something on the fireplace on the top, in the fireplace, on and in front of the fireplace. So I would put the countries on the top, into the fireplace, and on the bottom. So I would um, always um, modify the palace according to what I have to learn. And that's what I never do in memory sports. In memory sports, I have a specific palace, and I... I would not not change that. I would sometimes maybe I would, but actually I would keep it the same as always to be fast here. But if I do it for long term memory for stuff like the countries of Africa, for example, which I want to keep in mind, um, then I try to build also the memory palace a bit around the information, and uh, that's the difference here for me. Right, right. That's interesting. So, in terms of you know, modifying things and changing it and thinking about that next thing that you want to learn. A lot of people to ask, you know, can I reuse a memory palace? And my answer is always, well, there's no memory palace police that are going to stop you here. But, but, um, right. no, you know, what, uh, what, what are your experiences with that? You know, there's all kinds of things about adding multiple features you could, and Bruno, Jordana Bruno talked about like the infinite capability, you know, you would have not just, Memory Palace A, but like B, Memory Palace, C, Memory Palace, D, Memory Palace, all the same Memory Palace, modified simply mm -hmm. by the letter itself. But then on Station 1 in that Memory Palace, you could have A to Z, and inside of A, mm -hmm. there would be A to Z, and inside of A to, A to Z. This is all like sort of speculative. I don't think anybody has ever done such a thing. But just in terms of practical, mm -hmm. I mean, how could they? Infinity is uh, not reachable, but nonetheless, that's the, really. the concept of the infinite Memory yeah. Palace. But in terms of just reusing it once, twice, et cetera, do you do that? 
any little cool things you found uh, along the way in doing it, if you have, or how do you generally approach that when people ask you about it? Yeah, so um, when people ask me about it, it's it's almost every uh, always about uh, learning stuff, information. Um, for for the sport, I reuse all my 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 memory palaces, but I wouldn't recall the information. And if you don't recall, uh, if you don't do any recall or review, then you also forget it with the memory palace. So it's not sticking there forever if you don't review it. Um, so I can reuse them after a, a specific time. For real life stuff or like the countries, what I would do is, I mean, I would um, say I have the countries now. Now I want to memorize the capitals. So I would put the capitals on top of each location. And then I would memorize the uh, the number of, of, of people living there. I would put that on top. Then maybe the favorite dish they eat. I would put that on top, so I have a long chain of information on each on each location. And I think that's a way to reuse the memory palace to put more information to it. And what I recommend, if let's say you memorize the presidents of uh, of a specific country, then I would refrain to uh, memorize also the I don't know something what is too similar to that information. So I wouldn't memorize two shopping lists. Uh, on the same memory palace because I would um, get in trouble here. But I could memorize a shopping list and let's say uh, 10 animals, for example, because I know I don't want to buy animals. So uh, that's it. Different kind of information can be in the same memory palace for me um, because they don't interfere. And uh, yeah, I think that's, um, that's the way I would approach it. But I always recommend say, yeah, try to build more memory palaces. I mean, some people are living there with one memory palace with 40 locations, which is good to have in the beginning, of course, but it's good to create more and build on that. Um, yeah, and there are almost endless opportunities. You can use everything. You can use your apartment. You can use uh, the hotel, the vacation. You can use the park. There are so many possibilities, but also other stuff like, um, um, yes, other kinds of lists. You don't have to use a memory palace always, but... Yeah, that's a different topic. Well, what else can you do? <laughs> what else do you use? I mean, you can also use like uh, lists, like the easiest list um, um, is uh, like an animal list. So you have the, the ape, the bear, the chameleon, the, the dog, and you connect things to that list. You could also have a list, an alphabetic list on specific topics. Like, um, for example, you have like Italy as a topic, uh, as a topic. And then you need uh, things from Italy with an A, with a B, with a C. That would be your list. And your information you want to connect to that list, you connect it to the specific things in that list. So actually, it's a pack, uh, pack system here. Um, or I don't know if it's really called pack system. I would call it like that. Um, I think you wrote this article about something similar that uh, recently. So yeah, but uh, I prefer the memory palace in general right yeah well to me i mean any peg system or whatever i don't i experience i mean i don't think i have synesthesia or anything like that but i think i maybe do have something in that realm because i don't really experience space or i don't experience the alphabet just mm -hmm. phonically the alphabet is very much like a, a thing it's like in space in my head that mm -hmm. sort of uh moves so when i think of uh having an alphabet list or a bestiary or a peg or whatever it's already inherently spatial so if i'm gonna mm -hmm. have a cat the cat is not just c it's the thing next to the dog because d is dog right and so mm -hmm. it's made it a little bit maybe easier in some sense some exercises that that i've shared with people for me i guess because they're like a z b y c x etc right and like doing the alphabet backwards and all that um being able to mentally manage that because i just all it's already a memory palace so to speak and that's uh like that idea of on the first station of your memory palace you have a to z that's really referring to the idea that the memory the a to z memory palace is already spatial because alphabets are spatial. Mm. You know what I mean? So it's like yeah. Adam West is station one. And if Adam West has an A in his pocket, 
then Albert Einstein is station one. And if Albert Einstein had, you know, but so the next B is a different B than the other B in the other memory palace. You know what I'm saying? So it's mm -hmm. like, this is what used to be called Ars Combinatoria, or it's part of what used to be mm -hmm. called Ars Combinatoria in the older traditions. It's just this endless sort of combination based on spatial arrangements of alphabets, which are already inherently spatial. And when every letter is always already connected to a variety of things, you know, like I know a guy named Dan, but I also know Dracula and there's the rapper Drake, you know, like you have all kinds of D's that can be in all kinds of places preloaded, mm -hmm. ready to help you in many, many memory palaces. And I mean, so when you say it's uh, it's spatial for you, the alphabet, it's like, is it like a visual, you see it visually like space, or I'm not sure if I'm um, saying that in a good way here. So is it in your inner eye, do you see it spatial or how, how, can you describe that a bit better? I don't know. It's almost like I feel it. So uh, that's, that's would be the next thing what I ask. Yeah, do you feel it, right? Yeah, yeah I, I've done a bit of research into synesthesia, and mm -hmm. I have a student uh, named Ivar. He's really good at memory techniques, and mm -hmm. he experiences the calendar like almost like a roller coaster. You know, it's actually mm -hmm. like the calendar. His his experience of what we call a year is like some kind of circle with a loop in it, almost like a. Uh, Mm -hmm. um a mobius strip <laughs> you know uh, at least that's how i understand his description of the experience of the calendar mm -hmm. so my experience of alphabet or like a zero zero to 99 pao to me that's just another alphabet right it's yeah sure because whatever you know number for from um 11 or 10 to 19 they're all like t t t t t t right as as in a column that is somewhere in space but it's not like uh yeah. it's not like i see where it is i just feel this connective element mm -hmm. now that doesn't necessarily help me in competition in fact it doesn't help me in competition at all it slows me down because i have to think things feeling wise or it's almost like i have to like a being blind and connecting lego where i have to grab where that lego is and like socket it together so i'm quite mm -hmm. i've gotten faster but i'm still quite slow but nonetheless that's how i manage to work it all out is is this is kind of like kinesthetic auditory power sockets lego mm -hmm. sticking together if that makes sense yeah um What do you do is, I mean, you're working a lot with uh, with people uh, on their memory techniques. I mean, you have this spatial a uh, spatial feeling for an order of things. Let, let's phrase it like that. Um, and your your students might not have that in this way. Or do you teach them how to have that? Or do you say, uh, what, how how do you handle that? I mean, you have your specific approach. Mm. But it looks like that is not the same for everyone. So how do you handle that? What would be interesting? Well, I try to not have any approach, but rather use what you would call self-inquiry. So like a okay. lot of people with aphantasia come to me. And so I will say, you know, when did you, when was the last movie that you saw at a theater? Right. And then they'll tell me when, when that was like, let's just pretend it was I don't know, Jaws in this in, in the mm -hmm. 80s or 70s or whatever, right? And then I'll say, okay, so what is that like for you? And they'll say, well, nothing. I don't see anything in my head, which is how I was for many years. I now sometimes see images because I've worked on this for so long. It doesn't help me, but <laughs> I, I do now. Okay. But anyway, I'll say, <laughs> yeah. what what is that experience like? And I remember having a, a guy with aphantasia in my little Zoom room here, and we were going through this. And I said, so how do you experience the parking lot? You know, you do you remember driving there? He's like, yeah, of course I drove there. And in fact, he met a friend and he told me the story of how he met a friend. And I just asked him, what's happening in your mind when you reflect on that? And then, you know, he said these things about what's happening in his mind. And then I said, you know, now that parking lot, your memory of that parking lot in front of the movie theater, if you can then think in your head, about that time you met that friend in the parking lot. And if you need to memorize, I don't know, Johannes Malo, right? You can think about that parking lot 
whether you see it or not, just the concept of the parking lot where you met your friend and a giant marshmallow crashing down there or whatever that's going to get you to that sound of your last name. You know, it's just. And if you can't see it, can you hear it? Can you hear what? Can you imagine what it would sound like for a giant marshmallow to just smash mm -hmm. down on that parking lot? If that isn't the memory palace technique, I don't know what is. It doesn't you? Don't, you don't have right. to see it. But when people come to me and they say, "Well, I see fine, but I still can't remember," then I go, "Okay, can you feel what it's like? Can you hear it? Can you smell it? Can you taste it? How big is it? You know, I just ask questions, endless questions, mm -hmm. and the questions can get a little tiring. But if you, it, it's it's back to the journaling thing that you that I've heard you talk about before, and you talked about today. It's just kind of like. Okay, so I wanted to do 300 words instead of 200 words. So which mistakes did I make? What do I have to change? What do I have to reconfigure? So that's how I help people is just mm -hmm. ask ask questions they're not asking. And then when they are asking them, see if you can ask them differently, quote unquote, better until that you get to where you want to go and you figure it out. And yeah, you know. cool. Uh, because um, I what I do is when, when I um, work with people, it's like, we memorize together like a list of 100 words. And this list is uh, consists of concrete words, like a tree, for example, but also more abstract words, um, which are harder or may might seem harder to visualize as a single word. Um, and uh, why we are going through this list, it's, uh, it's a bit of a similar approach. The people tell me what they feel or what they see there. Mo many people start with, I try to create a concrete image out of every word, but it's sometimes it's just not really working here. And then it's this this feeling for a word. This really really helps. Like um, let's let's say some some word like to lose, for example. Um, there's a feeling about losing something, and this is not just a word. It's also um, it's something in my heart. So let's say. There, there is something which what what makes it so special. I have a feeling for that, mm. and um, that's something what I experience in my native language way better than in a foreign language. For example, I, I would never really start memorizing in in competitions English words. Of course, my English is okay and good, and I know a lot of vocabulary. Vocabulary, but it's not the same when I read dog. Or when I read Hund, this is the German word for a dog. For Hund, I have a, I don't know, there's a whole construct about, around that Hund. Because I know that when I was a little boy already, I was afraid of dogs. But dog is, it's the same, but it's not. Does it make sense? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah there's a specific feeling, a, a whole const construct around this specific word in my native language, but not in English. It's uh very interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and I think this is what's so great about teaching and sharing these experiences. Because you say Toulouse, I think Toulouse-Lautrec, right? <laughs> you might not know who the heck that yeah, dude yeah. is. And many yeah. people won't know who that dude is. But to me, that's like the yeah. most obvious association for Toulouse. Not that I have to. I see. <laughs> but if I'm memorizing a poem and it's like, you know, to lose your heart on the street or whatever, like, to lose the trek is probably going to be the best image uh, for that because he's in a movie. I think he's the guy in Moulin Rouge who, mm -hmm. you know, is presented in a very strange way. I don't know if he was really like that in history, but nonetheless, I've spent time with that dude, you know? So the more that that's the one thing I try to teach people to try to do is rather than building, I mean, build lists of images, but always try to think, what is the image I can choose that I spent the most time with? So if I was learning Hunt, you know, I would think perhaps Hound of the Baskervilles, which I can then connect mm -hmm. to Sherlock Holmes, for example. Now it's a it's a bit of a stretch, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, it's kind of it's connecting the fact that Hound probably comes from Hunt in the Germanic um mm -hmm. uh lineage or whatever. But you know, those those kind of workarounds and so forth. The more that it's connected to something that's already in your memory, as opposed to an abstract association, I find that helps people a lot. Mm -hmm. It certainly helps me. Uh, it's just a practice, really. Yeah. And, and just to add one more thing to that. So, 
for example, another word like suspicious, the word suspicious. And this is if I have to memorize it in a specific location, it's like me being there, being sus suspicious about something. And this is like if I would try to move or try to uh, do it with my body language, I would go a bit down, um, do it with, squeeze my eyes a bit like, like this. And uh, I'm suspicious right now. You know, yeah. it's it's a feeling, and um, and that's what I use here for memorizing abstract right, words, right. for example. Yeah. So you get your body into it. Yeah, yeah. I'm always there um, when I do, um, especially in memory sports. When I memorize stuff, and I'm very often interacting a lot by myself with the story, with the location, with the uh, objects which I'm memorizing there. I am there. I'm doing things. I'm experiencing things. I'm feeling things. I'm I'm sad. I'm happy. I'm jumping. I'm I don't know. I I do these things and very very often. That helps a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, one of the things that is a shift that a lot of people need to make. There, it there's a lot to being cerebral and conceptual, but then taking it into a concrete, even just imagined concrete action. Which is, you know, is in all the books, but I think they they need to do it, you know, as if it's mm -hmm. if it's, it's them or you can adopt that personality. But you bring to mind Anastasia Woolmer, who's the the Australian dancer who mm -hmm. won a competition here, and she talks a lot about, you know, how she uses the dance moves and stuff like this, uh, mm -hmm. getting that sort of physicality into it, which is you know, just a, a great thing if you can get, get yourself to do it. Um, just like you said, just slinking down uh, to, yeah. to, be, to be in that state of suspicion. That's that's a, a choreography, so to speak. It is. And when I come back to this location, I feel the same. And then I might recall that. that yeah, it's a choreography. That's uh, It's a good description. Huh? Good. Well, we've now <laughs> solved uh, all the problems for all the people. <laughs> Perfect. So we can uh, now we can reach, uh, go in retirement, right? So no need anymore. <laughs> but along those lines, uh, I mean, you tweeted. Sorry, you were going to say something. No, no. Go ahead. Just <laughs> you were tweeting just recently. You know, remind me. I think you said, "Why do we need memory techniques anymore?" I mean, AI is getting so much better and so forth. And I, I I'm sure you were being ironic, but at the same time. There is this this kind of John Michael Greer calls it prosthetic imagination, where the machines are basically replacing a lot of what we used to do. Like we used to imagine ourselves going and picking up an encyclopedia, for example. But now mm -hmm. it's almost like predictive search. You pick up the phone and it's just showing you what you were thinking because it already mm -hmm. knows who you are. <laughs> so, yeah, you know. Yeah. What do you what what do you think prompted that that question that you, you you sent out into the world? So this question was because I sometimes get these questions from people uh, when I talk about or when I talk with them about memory techniques or to improve on your learning skills, and then this sometimes pops up. Okay, if I want to know something, I just look it up in the internet and. If I want to um, uh, learn another language, I don't need that anymore because there are translators and stuff like that. So, um, and of course, it was kind of ironic, but on the other hand, it was also a bit like, yeah, let's 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 assume we have this brain interface, which is Elon Musk is working on, or whoever, or Mark Zuckerberg, I don't know, someone is working on it, and we have that at some point, so we can connect us our brain with some digital interface and all the information is just processing through that. Um, and then the question again, why do we need memory techniques at all then if we have that technology? And from time to time, I try to um, think that through think through that again, because um, it's important to, for me, it's important to know why I'm all still doing that. Because yeah, I, I always I, by myself I always uh, um, get myself or see myself looking things up instead of memorizing them. 
and more and more maybe maybe too much at some point and yeah it's an it's a, it's an honest question because i feel it needs to be addressed from time to time for myself to make sure that i still know why why i'm doing it because i don't want to do it just because of doing it i don't want to have memory techniques there in the world and using them because they are there and people use them i want to have a purpose and um yeah that that was actually where it was coming from no. well i think on your blog you have something that is a clue to me and inspiring to me anyway about the purpose of it because and you know forgive me if i misunderstood something reading in german but you mention a quote and you say basically fortunately we don't need the gods anymore and one thing that i really was drawn to in your quote is that you know we are building gods with these techniques of imaging the brain and then developing software that can interact with the brain and it's going to be i think and i talked about this with brad up years ago it's going to be this kind of thing where some people are probably going to protect their brains against all of this and maybe have to be warriors because memory to me is an image of freedom and this idea of having translators in your ears is not going to be as clean and fun as it seems it's going to be some sort of program deciding what is the appropriate term to use not the exact translation but the special translation that is approved by the great Neuralink translator, right? And our mm -hmm. freedom is going to come down to us being able to maintain and hold, quote unquote, natural human memory. Because as you said, fortunately, we don't need the gods anymore. But unfortunately, I don't know. I'm, I, you could, it could go either way. It could be a very positive thing. The, the computers could hold our freedom <laughs> in, mm -hmm. instead but it doesn't look like it's going that way so i think that this and that's why i'm personally so passionate about this tradition is i see it as a path to maintaining human freedom and getting the best mm. of both worlds but that's what i loved about your tweet and that question because i and i sort of it didn't answer it directly but that's kind of what i had in mind in my answer to your tweet is i'm just thinking you know we need we need this memory to to make sure that we don't we don't build a god because that god's going to dictate our translations that we think we enjoy and and exactly it's already dictating what you see when you see it how you see it through predictive hmm. dynamic dynamic behavior response marketing they call it <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah so and that's uh thank you very much for answering that question uh here um so maintaining your freedom or our freedom this is a very very good answer to that i feel um what i was or what i what i'm very careful always about is that there is some there's everything is changed and we have these devices and everything is going digital and neuralink whatever so i don't want to um i always try to give also credit to that to say okay maybe it's a good thing maybe it's it's not too bad maybe it's not not just too bad Maybe it's a good thing and we shouldn't be too scared of that because uh, even the um, people 2000 years ago, they were always like the young people. They are so bad. They're making everything bad right now. And it, it's not good. No, no, it's a, it's a wrong way. Even the Romans two year, 2000 years ago said that. So I try to um, think it from the other side to say, okay, maybe it's something a step forward, but this answer from your side, I have to reflect a bit more on that. Uh, think about it, and because that's uh, it's a it's a very good answer. Maintain our own freedom. Make sure that we are still free. Um, the question is then maybe, wouldn't you get more freedom if you could talk to everyone in the world? You can't, could say if you have a translator in my in my ear, I could talk to everyone, not just to people who speak English or maybe French or whatever language I'm speaking. Um, so that could be an additional part. So it could give you freedom as well to have this this device and increase your freedom extra in an extraordinary way. So yeah, I'm, I'm already in a process of 
thinking through that argument. That's uh, very cool. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I also think it could go in a very very positive direction, and it's it's not necessarily anything anyone can know, but I think it's worth thinking through all those possible sure. ramifications. Um, and I do, I, I, I am a little bit concerned just simply on the thing of like, yeah, it'd be amazing to talk to everybody, but you know, there's, there, there's, there's so much, uh, je ne sais quoi in language. I don't know what, what it is in, in language, like kind of, I guess in German, exactly what I'm mm -hmm. trying to say, but you know, um, there's things that a translator is never going to take care of. Even Forget about censorship concerns. There's just like a, a certain flavor to things. You know, uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to think of a perfect German phrase like unter dem Tisch gefallen or something. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just not going to translate well. Uh, like mm -hmm. if you've forgotten something, yes, it's unter dem Tisch gefallen. Like if I say that out, 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 uh, in English, oh, it fell under the table. <laughs> it's just like it doesn't. It doesn't translate. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, there's yeah. a ta there's a there's such an extraordinary feeling to that, which even if I misunderstand certain things in German and I learn weird words in German sometimes, like abgebaggert, and people are just like, "Where the hell did you get that that word from?" And it's like maybe like a regional thing. Or I don't know what. But um, what was it? <laughs> I didn't get it. What was word. it? Which word? I'm trying to say abgebaggert, like uh. I guess it's like really tired. Yeah. Is it like really tired or something like that? <laughs> um, I'm not sure if this is a word, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Okay. It's in Go the ahead. German dictionary yeah. of slang. So yeah. it, it, it's, okay, it's cool. definitely printed somewhere. But um, okay. But, but there's just lots of words like that. Like Sigmal, mm -hmm. that must be a more common one. Sigmal for uh, uh, mm -hmm. umpteen times, I think. Um, anyway, the, the, the point being is that that's, that's part of the richness of language is like making mistakes in it talking to the person and being like, no, I never heard that word. Or, you know, here's how we would really say it. That, that seems to me a, a, a thing that is just too much to lose. The cost of losing that, I think outweighs the price of what they call zero latency speed of communication. Yeah, it's convenient and so forth, but convenient to whom? The advertiser, the corporation, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's the thing that i think we really have to go through in our minds because i try to watch a video with you an interview with you and i have to sit there and watch this advertisement that is non-clickable which you know is great i'm sure it gives you some some revenue and so forth but it's like the price of that when people come to memory sports and how many people just click away because they're not going to watch this ridiculous ad i mean is it worth it in the end? I, that, yeah. Those are the kinds of things that I really think deeply about. Right. Yeah. So, of course, you could think about the super AI, which is also reflecting on that stuff. So um, doing the <laughs> even, even better uh, translation. But yeah, of course, the mm. whole process, uh, the whole, whole process of communicating with each other, of thinking about the right words, finding the right words, maybe using the wrong wrong word first then trying to phrase it even better this would maybe fall apart yeah maybe true but maybe you're right maybe the the super ai will actually just be just like us and totally yeah <laughs> mess things up and then it will say oh i'm sorry i got that wrong <laughs> yeah just just because we are used to it why not i mean yeah that's what people i mean people um, people go more and more vegetarian and vegan, but they still still eat meat or not meat, but they still eat food which looks like meat. It's like the same, isn't it? So it's like pretending it's meat, but it's not. But you feel, oh, it looks a bit like meat. Yeah, it's nice. So maybe that way. Well, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting thing to think through too, because that's, that's the self-reflexive nature of reality. I mean, the mm -hmm. first advertisement for the metaverse was a bunch of robots and aliens playing cards. Yeah, yeah, I, which, I saw that. Yeah, which to me is just like a sign of how tedious and boring the metaverse is going to be. Because if the best thing that they could come up with is playing cards in a in a room with your friends that you could just be playing with in a room with your real friends, it's just like anyway. But speaking of cards, I wanted to ask you about poker. How how, how is that going? Are you still playing poker? 
Not really. Um, just for sometimes two or three times a year with some friends sitting mm. in a nice, in a garden or something, but uh, not really anymore. I was playing a lot of poker when in 2000, when I started memory sports also, but it was not a, never really, really related to that. Uh, it was rather a fun thing and trying to earn some money for my studies. Um, it didn't, I mean, I made out of 50 bucks, I made 2000 over a couple of years. Um, for a hobby, it's not too bad, but actually I don't recommend playing poker for, for a living. So if you're good at it, go ahead. But I was never good at it, uh, not good enough. So right, yeah. right. Okay, but so... Where, where is this question? Where is this question come from? Well, I just saw you in a TV spot with some, I see. Okay, some yeah. cards in your hand yeah. and they were mentioning poker. And then I was thinking, because a lot of people ask me about poker and you know, some of the obvious things that poker people have talked about when they use mnemonics is destroying cards. So when you've seen a card, you mentally destroy it. It's like memory techniques with a twist. So instead of mm. instead of remembering the card, you you add a feature to it essentially. So they'll bur they'll mentally burn their image for Queen of Clubs or what have you. So I just wondered if you had played around with that at all. As yeah, advantage. I mean, especially for uh, poker or for a Texas Hold'em poker, which is played um, very often, is that you don't have such an advantage in memorizing or just throwing cards because you just see, see two cards. There's You have to memorize your own two cards, of course, but then you get three to five cards in the middle, but you'd never see the cards of the other people. Um, or very often you don't see them. So it doesn't make so much sense to memorize the cards because you get a new uh, deck after the in the next round, everything is shuffled and you start over again. What you could memorize is like um, possibilities for specific combinations. You could also memorize like tells from the others if you recognize something, what is going on about a person when he has a good cards or bad cards. You could memorize these kind of things, but in terms of memorizing the card combinations, it doesn't help you so much. Mm, okay. Well, I read a whole book. I don't know poker, but I read a whole book about a guy who uses mnemonics in poker and he had all these kinds of ideas. So that's... Um... Okay. I, I never felt I I need that, but right, right. <laughs> I, I'm not a poker pro. Uh, I don't I don't know that his book is uh, on the top seller list anyway, but it's, it, it was an interesting book in terms of, you know, the idea cool. of destroying cards. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I... Also... I um... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I just also don't know what kind of poker he was playing or what 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 um anything about the game. I I I'm a former amateur semi semi not amateur magician and people always cool. ask me, oh, you you must be uh dangerous in a game of cards and it's like don't play. I'm a magician and don't want my fingers broken. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Good one. Cool. Uh cool. Well, what, it, what would you say is like the number one thing that you wish people knew about what memory means to you and that would get them excited about joining the memory competition world? We know there's lots of challenges because people can't meet as easily as they used to, uh, and can't travel as easily as they used to, et cetera. But you have the online versions and, you know, what mm -hmm. what, what do you want people yeah, right to know now about it? So right now, what I um, yeah, uh, what I do is on Twitch, we have these online competitions and I'm promoting and commentating on them. And it's fun. Um, I think the main thing, what I would like to, people to, to believe is that it's working for everyone and that everyone is capable on improving here. Of course, there might be people with some mental disease. It's a different story. But uh, for everyone else, it's possible. And I hate when people say, oh, I can't even memorize like a list of seven words. It's too much. Uh, it's not possible for me. It might work for you, but not for me. I hate that. So I feel it would be great that everyone knows it works. You just have to work on it. Right, right. Well, that, that's that's a great message. And I, I, I wish I knew more about how to convince people to get them over on that other side, yeah. but I appreciate the work that you're doing and you've got a course, uh, for guessing, Kernan Z for guessing, I think it's called, uh, mm -hmm. you can forget about forgetting. Can we translate it that way? 
Yeah, it might be a good translation. Yeah, yeah, right. It's a it's a it's a German course. I did a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's uh it's a good one if you want to get into memory sports. It's German. Uh, not memory sports, memory techniques uh in general and a lot of yeah, examples and so on. So yeah, it's a good one. Cool, cool. <laughs> well, I hope people will check that out and you know, thank you so much sure. for for this conversation. I really appreciate it and hope to chat again sometime soon. Anthony, it was a pleasure. And I feel that there is so much other stuff we could talk about. So thanks for inviting me. And um, yeah, have a nice one. It's already half past, what is it, 12 right now in the middle of the night. So I will go to bed right now. Yeah, uh, it's 0.30 uh, almost. Then schlaf schön und Danke schön. Und bis gleich. Genau, das heißt bis bald. Bis bald, ja, das ist besser. Genau, genau, genau. genau. <lacht> genau. Hat, hat, hat Spaß gemacht und äh, lass uns in Kontakt bleiben. Und äh, ähm, sagst du mir, wann du das veröffentlichst oder schickst du einen Link? Wie machst du das? Äh, ja, mag ich das äh, oder, oder ich werde das tun äh, gerne und ähm, es wird, es werde, es ich mag es so bald wie möglich äh, okay. äh, veröffentlicht. Und äh, ja, wie gesagt, vielen, vielen Dank. Und äh, <lacht> auch für äh, ein, bisschen Deutsch, äh, ein bisschen Deutsch zu sprechen. Das, das ist immer schön. Ja, um, yeah. and, and, and I have one more question um, for you. So um, you have this magnetic memory method. So why is it magnetic? Mm. I was always like, okay, it's sticking. and But why magnetic? What is this? <laughs> What is it? What is it about that? And I was reading a lot on, on on your side about it, but it never really, I never really catch it. Why it is a magnetic memory method? Yeah, well, it, it does have to do with the idea that magnets stick things in place. Yeah. But it also has to do with the fact that magnets repel. So ah. part of the idea is, can we use memory techniques in such a way that we're focused on something, just one thing? and exclude the other things. So we actually get something done. Mm. And the other reason, the other thing about it is method is chosen as opposed to system, because I really think, and I love your opinion on this, I think people have to create their own systems. So it's a method for helping people create their own memory uh -huh. systems. And cool. my philosophy from the beginning with the podcast is that this is a, magnetic attraction of as many people as I can get on the podcast. Uh, you know, I sometimes take breaks from interviews and I sometimes think I'm a pretty bad interviewer actually, but um, I try to improve my game and sometimes taking a break from interviewing helps with that. But the idea is, is to like try to create like a university um, uh, uh, where there's multiple people speaking. And so I've done lots and lots of interviews over the years to attract more and more people to each other to, to a certain extent. And, um, you know, that's so far so good. <laughs> the, the, the game is early, I think. Cool. Thanks. Um, that's part of the thinking. That makes sense. That. Plus you have yeah. to call something. Yeah. You have to call things something. <laughs> of course. And it's, so. it's this, this trip, this triple M is very, is also very sticky, it's sticky. It's, uh, it's magnetic itself. M M M magnetic yeah. memory method so oh, nice idea cool yeah, yeah. Well, I and i like this uh, i like this approach of teaching people a method to create their own systems and uh yeah that's that's great cool thanks yeah. well thank you thanks for asking about that and yeah it's um well as you know it's it's one of the best things that you could be involved in memory because Memory is the foundation, or at least, I mean, the brain is the foundation, but the brain seems to have these multiple parts that basically mm -hmm. produce memory. And I don't know what you think, but I think that consciousness is nested in memory or memory is the thing, the, the operations of, of the multiple levels of memory, you know, are the thing that produce the effect of consciousness or operate it or run it or whatever. I'm sure there's no fast and hard statement, but I, I don't yeah, think the, yeah, I don't think the universe is conscious is what I'm saying. I don't think matter is conscious. I think consciousness is an effect of the operation of multiple levels of memory 
that the brain, not just in humans, but in other animals is creating yeah, see, or running. But, but how would you explain meditation then? A state in meditation where you just, just have awareness. Is awareness. this still yeah, like like just being aware in a in a mental state of meditation? Is in this uh, situation you wouldn't use any or memories or it wouldn't be it would be still nested in memory, but on the other hand, it's you don't need it to be in that state and you're still conscious. Does it make sense what I what I am going to say? Trying to yeah. say, yeah. Uh, well, what do you say? Die Dinge beim Namen nennen. <laughs> I'm not a sci I'm not a neuroscientist, so let's call a spade a spade. Yeah. But um, if I were to just speculate, awareness, consciousness. This is a conditioning effect that uh -huh. is making you aware of awareness, aware of consciousness, right? And how do you mm -hmm. get there? Well, you train yourself to do it. So this mm -hmm. is something that required memory to happen in the first place. So mm -hmm. Atma Vakarya, which is sometimes called self-inquiry. This is a Sanskrit term that's used in meditation. Um, mm -hmm. Some people say that actually it's called self-remembering. So... The mm. very act of a, a like that should be the better translation, not self inquiry, but self remembering and self inquiry, mm -hmm. like remembering to ask the question. Uh, mm -hmm. So, a lot of awareness training, I think, is just simply remembering to bring yourself back to awareness. Not that you are necessarily in a state of awareness, but that you are maintaining it through a recall back when you drift. And so, there are people who talk about the yanas. And how that you can descend through all these different levels and yada, yada, yada. But every single training that they talk about has to do with remembering when to execute the specific, quote unquote, mental move that allows you to maintain the state, descend or transcend or ascend or whatever word they're using for these different models. So in the end, I think it's all memory. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, my experience with states that are called nervi kalpa samadhi, nir is like nothing, Can, kalpa is a word for thought, so no thoughts and bliss, like mm -hmm. this wonderful state. The, the, the first thing that bumps me out of it is like words and stuff. So it's like memory gets you into it and memory bumps you out of it. <laughs> yeah, so, that's, that's, that's true, but the state is still there, so... Oh, yeah. Between bumping in and bumping out, there's something. And yeah, at this, I, this point, you, yeah, you know what I mean? I think yeah. I know where you're going and I I don't know the answer. But my feeling sure. is, is that if consciousness is a ground and mm -hmm. when we're born, we somehow are patched into it. And then that, that that's like ideas like chi. The, that's mm -hmm. ideas like mind the world is built from mind or consciousness and so forth and I, i'm sympathetic to that kind of stuff but all my favorite meditation teachers and all my favorite people like bruno their answer and robert uh flood who was the ars combinatoria guy and like the square art of memory versus the the round art of memory ars quadrata versus ars rotunda their answer to all of this is you got a three pound brain man You think you're going to figure that shit out? It's just like, good luck. And yeah, that's true. <laughs> Robert Flood has the most amazing image in one of his books. He's talking about memory and all this stuff. He has a black square. And he says, you really want to understand the memory palace technique? You really want to understand your quest, your desire, your thirst to have encyclopedic knowledge and remember everything? Get used to nothing. Right? And in that nothing... There's four kinds of nothing. And then, you know, blah, 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 blah. But the whole thing is, is that foundation, whatever it is, you have to silence even your thoughts about that. So mm -hmm. that that's not going to satisfy a scientist. But in, in terms of the meditation practice, you're going for blowing out the candle even of that curiosity you know so mm -hmm. i don't i don't know the scientific answer but if it turns out that the universe is conscious 
great. My question would be, so what? You know, like it's just what changes if that's true? <laughs> Apparently nothing. Yeah, true. <laughs> so I like Robert Flood. He's yeah. just like black square. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks for the insight. And uh, okay, now I call it the day for myself. Yes, and yes. Thanks, well, thanks a lot. Good. See you next time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, have Just a nice time. one. <laughs> Cheers. Bye bye. You know, bye bye. Oh. Well, I want to thank Johannes for all of his insights into using a memory journal and everything that he shared. It's so inspiring when it comes to, you know, just using your memory for different feats and thinking about memory in different ways for both those competitive outcomes and for how that you can use them for long-term retention of information. So thank you again so much for being part of this community, for hitting that thumbs up, for getting subscribed if you're not already. And please share this around. This is how the community grows. It's how we get more people improving the quality of their minds so that we are able to have that freedom that we were talking about in this interview. And I want that to grow and grow and grow for the good of all the future generations yet to come. And if we ever do invent time machines, well, we'll want that freedom for the past as well. Thank you again. Special thanks to the channel members who support this channel and everyone who has one of my books and courses. I hope you'll go and check out Johannes's course as well, especially if you speak German. And if you're not speaking German and you want to, then why not dive in and expose yourself to a little bit more? And I'll have some links to some interviews. You can listen to Johannes speak in German in interview settings down below and you know, I think that it's one of the most beautiful languages in the world. And if you haven't started learning it, I hope that you will, because there's a lot of cool memory trainings that you can find in German auf Deutsch, and they're really, really special. So thank you again. And until we have a chance to speak again, keep yourself magnetic.